You're listening to Nightmare on Film Street. The current time is 666. Traffic is clear ahead from here to the afterlife. But it's hell outside. For the next hour, you're on Nightmare Time. So, let's give a grave welcome to our hosts, John and Kim. Hello again, fiends, and welcome to Nightmare on Film Street. I'm John. I'm Kim. You didn't say horror for the casually obsessed, by the way. Welcome to Nightmare on Film Street, the horror podcast for the casually obsessed. Are you happy? Yep. (laughs) You made me start doing it, so you have to do it also. This is part two of our Kooky Cannibals podcast. Part one, we covered Jackie Kong's Blood Diner, which, as we learned, was an unofficial sequel to today's Kooky Cannibal movie, Herschel Gordon Lewis's schlocky 1963 masterpiece, Blood Feast. Masterpiece? As far as schlock goes, yeah. Okay. Like, just in the same way that, like, the Toxic Avenger should be on the Mount Rushmore of trauma movies. It doesn't mean that the Oscars are ever going to recognize it. <laughs> we'll talk about it. We will. Uh, because I think, I feel like Masterpiece is, it's, it's rubbery like tap. It's one of those words that just <laughs> doesn't quite describe the emotion you have for something. <laughs> If you're new to the Nightmare on Film Street podcast or you haven't caught up on the last couple episodes, we've switched up the format a little bit. We are doing our regular head-to-head episodes now as two-parters. This is part two of the Kooky Cannibals miniseries, I suppose we can call it. That's not a bad idea. It's two episodes. It's not really serious. That's what makes it mini. You know. (laughs) Uh, Part one. John said, uh, Blood Diner, super fun. Go back and check that one out in the feed. This one is Blood Feast. But before we get into the masterpiece, I'm being rude. Before we get into the film, (laughs) John, what's keeping you creepy this week? Fantastic Fest starts this week, which would have been a much bigger film festival. Back to its its like old booze filled days. (laughs) Are you speaking like for you and I? Fantastic Fest is notorious for having great parties, and unfortunately, they had to cancel those last minute because of the Delta variant. Surprise, surprise. But Fantastic Fest is still going. They are hosting in-person screenings, limited capacity, and they are doing a virtual component as well. So regardless of where you are, whether you're not in the Austin City proper, you can still check out some of the incredible programming at Fantastic Fest. It really is one of the best genre film festivals of the year. And if you can't check it out, uh, John and I have already covered a lot of films that are playing at Fantastic Fest this year, as well as we will be covering the festival and hitting up any films uh, that tickle our weird and creepy fancy. So head to nofspodcast.com for all of that review goodness, because, you know, that's kind of what we do here. As well, Mike Flanagan's got a new horror thing coming to Netflix. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with The Haunting of Bly Manor, The Haunting of Hill House. Hell, you've probably seen Dr. Sleep, I bet. Gerald's Game, Hush, and more. <laughs> he's got he's got a new movie. He's got a new miniseries coming to Netflix called Midnight Mass. It's seven parts. We've seen it. Uh, but also, there's a really weird embargo on it in that we can't talk about anything. really any of the things that we liked in it. Yeah, and here's the thing. <laughs> there are a few things that I really like about it that we'll just have to talk about with you in the Nightmare on Film Street yeah, Discord like, this weekend. Really like to and would like to talk about. Yeah. So obviously we know kind of from Flanagan, he's a huge Stephen King fan and this is very in the vein of, you know, the Castle Rock Stephen king averse even though it's uh, an original property. This yep. is something that Flanagan's been mulling over for a while And it's got that small town vibe, perfect for a limited series. There's a bunch of really cool characters. Shout out to the sheriff. He's so dreamy. Uh, (laughs) And that's not a spoiler. (laughs) Yeah, if you don't know anything about it, it's set on a small fishing island just off the mainland. Think Castle Rock. Kim really wasn't lying when she (laughs) said it's very Stephen King inspired. And yeah, strange stuff happens on the island we uh, you know it, it also deals a lot with the idea of faith some of the darker sides of of religion and also alcoholism is a big theme as well um and death you and know death <laughs> really really looking forward to talking with you guys about that uh once it hits netflix because there are like we said there are some really cool things in this that are worthy of discussion but we will unfortunately have to wait 
Yeah, but uh, when we can talk about it, come join us in the Discord, the Nightmare on Film Street Discord at nofspodcast.com slash Discord. There is a spoiler zone where we, um, it's basically been a malignant zone for, oh, it sure for, has. for a few weeks, but I'm sure we'll we'll migrate over to Midnight Mass when that lands on Netflix. Speaking of malignant, I don't, I don't know if you guys have taken the opportunity to see it again. We have now seen it in the theater three times. E- since last week's episode, it, back in the feed, if you want to hear our spoiler-free thoughts on it, we've got a whole episode of it. There's a whole spoiler-filled discussion in the Nightmare on Film Street Fiend Club. But uh, we're probably, you know, knowing us, probably going to end up seeing this fucking movie again, I would think. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> it's not too... I can't remember the last time I saw a movie three times in the theater since I was, like, 11. I'm having so much fun watching and rewatching this movie. We're running out of new people to bring with us to, <laughs> to experience it again anew. Definitely one to see with friends and family, providing they're in your bubble or whatever your uh, local rules are. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. If you're looking for something new to watch with your friends, though, you should join us for the Friday Night Watch Party that we're having tomorrow, if you're listening to this the day the podcast comes out. That's going to be Friday, September 24th, starting at 8 p.m. EST. We're going to be doing a B-movie double feature. Kicking it off, we're we're watching The Blob. The The OG Blob. The OG Steve McQueen Blob. He fucking is so embarrassed by that movie. It's so good, though. Uh, And our second movie is a mystery film, but it's going to be an alien sex romp. I'm I'm very excited. It's a really great B movie double feature. It's total drive in style. So, uh, pop some popcorn, grab a soda pop, and join us for that. That is at the NOFS Fiend Club at nofspodcast.com slash fiend club. It's part of our exclusive little membership zone. Um, for six bucks a month, you can access uh, watch parties like that, merch, swag, discounts, and uh, a little s- secret thing that we are currently plotting and we'll be announcing soon uh, a Halloween party uh, that'll be really, really cool. Um, Should we say it's a murder mystery? Did I just say it's a murder mystery? I'm very excited. (laughs) It kind of sounds like you just said it was a murder mystery. It's a murder mystery. Apparently it's not a secret anymore. (laughs) It's still a secret. I haven't made images yet. (laughs) Yeah, join us for a murder mystery themed Halloween party this October in the Fiend Club. It's going to be a blast. But also join us, join us this Friday for that double feature. I can't, man, it's been a while since we've done like a like a legit drive-in double feature. And there are no two better movies to play than a classic and then a weird fucking movie you didn't even know existed. Yeah, and goofy movies are the best ones to watch with friends and stuff because we always have such a blast riffing in the chat and dropping gifs and just being like hooligans in there. It's always so much fun. Shit, we almost forgot. Elvira's back on Shudder this Saturday. I cannot believe it. Like a four movie marathon with Elvira. I'm I'm so excited. Like, that is, oh, it's so great. Like, obviously, October, full of tons of shit to watch on every single station, but Halloween programming has officially started. And who better to kick it off than the Mistress of the Dark herself? But it is time to dive into the potty parts of humans, because it's cannibal. Yep. With Cookie Cannibals, part two, Blood Feast. Ladies and gentlemen, You're about to witness some scenes from the next attraction to play this theater. This picture, truly one of the most unusual ever filmed, contains scenes which under no circumstances should be viewed by anyone with a heart condition or anyone who is easily upset. We urgently recommend that if you are such a person or the parent of a young or impressionable child now in attendance, that you and the child Leave the auditorium for the next 90 seconds.
I'm a big fan of trailers that are like, you might want to leave the theater before for the next 90 seconds if this is too much for you. Ma'am, get your little boy out this theater now. I love too that he <laughs> waits, like the, the trailer waits no time before just pulling a girl's tongue out. Like, I don't <laughs> think mom would have had enough time to get the kids out of the theater before that. That was a surprisingly gory trailer. Yeah, you, you would never even see a trailer like that anymore, right? Well, I, I don't know if people are using, like, real sheep parts, you know, in films <laughs> these days. <laughs> if you're curious, Herschel Gordon Lewis's Blood Feast is currently sitting at a 5.1 out of 10 on IMDb, 38% on Rotten Tomatoes, and 2.7 out of 5 on Letterboxd. It may surprise you to know, Kim, critics Didn't did not like, it. like this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the most part, no one liked it. Were think- critic reviews, like, Ew, gross. <laughs> Pretty much. It seems like Variety like had a, like a heyday trying to talk about how bad this movie was and how immoral it was. The LA Times called it a blot on the American film industry. Oh, my. <laughs> but I did see on the Wikipedia page that uh, the Austin Chronicle liked it. Like, <laughs> it's like, eh, this is really low budget and the acting's not very good, but it's charming. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading that it was... The kind of the spark of the idea was in response to Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. Oh, so the the trailer as well, too, right? Like the trailer itself is a gimmick. Oh, yeah, that's a vibe. But mainly because of Hitchcock's, I guess, artful nature of cutting away and like the innuendo of the violence. Yeah. And so... They were like, no, the violence is is in lieu of the story. <laughs> <laughs> what if all we had was violence and we found a story in the editing room? <laughs> but it's also why they insisted on shooting this in full color because they oh, wanted see. that viscera of sheep parts. You know, that's the thing about Blood Feast that is really, really good. Talk about blood. <laughs> The colors in this movie pop. Oh, yeah. I love that 60s, everything's a primary color world. Yeah. Uh, The fucking bathtub in the opening kill. Love that. I was like, oh, yeah, look, a leg. That's great. Good work, guys. But that tub, though. Well, even just the- That is a nice tub. (laughs) You just want like a seafoam green tub. I just do. And you've wanted it since you since you were terrified of The Shining. I just want it. That scene though, where he's like hacking at her, and and we can see her hand on the tiles behind him, just like slowly falling down into the tub, is so fucking good. I don't know if it's that he just put all the lights of Chicago on every scene that he was shooting, or if it's a film stock. He thing. loves a spotlight, and I love that he loves a spotlight. Yeah, zero care for shadows being cast on the wall. Oh, dig it. It's, but it makes everything look vibrant as fuck. Yeah, and the lighting makes the killer's makeup and hair. <laughs> Especially the hair. S- just seem otherworldly because yeah. he's wearing like the, the, you know, the old almost like grease paint makeup that you would put on your hair, like the hairspray that makes your hair, like changes the texture of it and it mats it down. It looks like it would be crunchy to touch. Oh, the yeah. The gray of his yeah, hair. Yeah, yeah. And he, and they have it in his eyebrows too. <laughs> they sure and do. you just, you can feel the texture with your eyes. <laughs> Oh, man, I love how he looks. And I would not trust him to cater any party of mine (laughs) whatsoever. Especially for how often he's like, hasn't been done in 5,000 years. Yeah, he's a he's a shady looking dude. How did Dorothy Friedmont come to have such a business relationship with Fod Ramsey's? Well, she came in in her Sunday best. And sure she- did. <laughs> and she was like, I want to have the strangest feast in honor of my daughter's thingy thing <laughs> on two Sundays from this Sunday. I got the impression she's hired him before, right? No. No? No, not at all. This She was just like... My daughter's into weird education things because she doesn't want to wed down. <laughs> yeah, my daughter's one of those crazy girls who likes education. <laughs> yeah, and she's like, I'll go to that weird food place and get her some weird food because oh, she's right. weird and educated. <laughs> yeah, don't go to the weird store looking for weird stuff because it'll find you. Uh, but the feast is also cursed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so another another movie where it's fun, too, to know that Blood Diner was a 
intended sequel to this movie because you can really really see it soft sequel i do love the liberties taken like the brain in a jar <laughs> yeah, well I, that all probably came so here's the thing i think they were supposed to in like the original draft of the screenplay before it became its own movie probably resurrecting fought ramses right Ooh. and then that's that's the brain that would have been in the jar Ooh. instead of uncle anwar Oh, I like it. Yeah, wouldn't that have been great? Oh, I love it. We should do more sequels like that. Yeah. Where, you know, like, sure, it's like a sequel to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, I was going to but... say, Texas Chainsaw Massacre <laughs> 2 sequels where you just, like, go off the fucking rails. Yeah. Like, oh, you're not even in a train anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and Leatherface has, like, his dad's brain in a jar and it talks to him. I'm always And it gives him the jars. instructions for chili. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And, it's, and it's kids in a van. I want this. <laughs> <laughs> and a radio host because I want this movie. So this was your first watch. What did you what did you think Blood Feast was gonna be? Is this exactly what you expected? This is exactly what I expected. Right it on. was, I will say, way more gore than I was expecting. It's a weird level of gore. We weirdly gratuitous in terms of just the fleshy bits I had I was subjected to. It had it had to be a lot Lots for a of 1963 organ meat. audience. Yeah, like yeah. a lot of organ meat for 1963, but also just a lot of organ meat in general. More organ meat than that show where people used to have to eat like bull testicles. Fear Factor? Yes. Okay. More organ meat than that. <laughs> I think that show just had like spiders, cockroaches, and bull testicle and budget. Bull t- and eyeballs sometimes, like really? sheep's eyeballs. Ugh. Oh, yeah. And then I, I just, my one memory was that somebody was like eating one and he was like, there's this like weird film you have to get over before you even get to the eye part. And you're just, oh. I was just like, no, please don't describe it. Ugh. Just Was it the host saying that or was it the no, guy eating it? No, don't describe it. it. The, I think it was the guy eating it. Ugh. I but yeah, so yeah. I'm not a huge organ meat person. I do very much love the coloring of the blood and oh, like yeah. just the fact that they fucking went for it <laughs> with the violence. It really is in lieu of story. There is a plot. There's totally a plot. There is a plot, but the amount of screen time just dedicated to a hand feeling around a heart and pulling pulling with air quotations a heart out of a chest and yeah. just like holding it up for the camera. Just ten minutes long almost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's a little lengthy, which is hysterical too when you know that this movie is sixty seven minutes. Minutes. Didn't it feel like a two-hour movie? It felt like a full movie. Yeah, it felt like a whole ass movie. It felt like a whole ass movie. But uh, you know, whatever. It's only sixty-seven minutes of your time. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it feels a little dun, long, you're not wasting the day. Dun. Yeah. So I'm not. I'm not nuts about you don't, the score. You don't like the score. You don't like it's the, fine. It's slow and drags its foot a little bit, kind of like the serial killer. Oh, whose foot did improve throughout the movie? I loved his foot. It's so his foot grew on me. The fact that he had the limp one, nice little serial killer trait. Kind of enjoyed it. <laughs> really liked it when he was stalking that couple on the beach. That beach scene, and his foot was dragging in the sand. I was like. Okay. I'm back on board with All this right. bu- with this bum foot. I bought the foot. <laughs> I love that beach scene. Honestly, any of the nighttime sequences are so so good. Like they just look amazing. Are they? What are, what are, are you we, even talking what about? What are we talking about? Okay, the night the nighttime <laughs> sequences that are very clearly on a set okay. are great. The I was lighting say, in those scenes. I do very much enjoy when we would be in a nighttime sequence and then all of a sudden we'd be in a daytime sequence just with the brightness scaled way down. There is there is a moment where <laughs> Detective Pete is hanging out with Suzette, who they've met. They, they meet each other at the Egyptian Education And he Center. reveals he's a full-out creep. Total creep. So they're in a car together <laughs> under the moonlight. Creep. He offers to give her a ride home, and then the next scene we see is him just, like, parking in the middle of at nowhere. At Lover's Lane. <laughs> yeah. Also, she's, I'm going to say, probably in film language, 18 years old. At he best. He is a pushing 48. What are you talking about? He is a 48 playing a steely 27. Like, mm. I think he's supposed to be a younger detective. Oh, I don't know. And then they were- He is, he is a 50-year-old He's man. also in her Egyptian college class. <laughs> Yeah, because he likes to learn. He... <laughs> <laughs> but no, the worst part is that he parks and they're talking a little bit about all oh, these killings that are happening. And, he, and he's, you know, you'd probably be safer with the murderer than here in this car with me. And then like, everybody's what? red flags are going off. <laughs> Alarm bells everywhere. And she's just like, <laughs> 
but it looks incredible. No, it looked it looked great until until he pulls out <laughs> to leave, and we are now using a uh, a very dimly lit shot that is not as high contrast. Clearly, and... a sunny ass day. Yeah, <laughs> it's something, <laughs> but it's fine. It was thoroughly enjoyable. And those are those are the touches that make this movie endearing because there's there's this weird juxtaposition of like really great shit, really yeah. wonderful POV shots where we're showing Fod Ramsey's lifting up a machete and his crazy ass eyes and we're in the POV of a victim and that stuff is like insanely good. But oh, then yeah. it's juxtaposed by these wide shots where the camera like finds the character and has to like adjust mid shot and they're like that's good enough we, we fucking got it we did it <laughs> and i love that so much i just love that just like fucking nailed it <laughs> well the other thing too like we were watching a few behind the scenes documentary bits like interviews with Herschel Gordon Lewis that, that are all available on the Arrow video channel you gotta you gotta check those guys out and he was talking about his approach to filmmaking he's like look all you're doing is selling tickets you're getting butts in seats you are not making art it, it's a fucking movie it's entertainment and that's all that matters so for him to like worry about the camera jittering because somebody bumped into it not gonna happen i fucking love that though and he's also his own cinematographer he's the guy who shot it <laughs> ultimately he's the one who says yeah we got it let's move on one of my favorite instances of this like wandering camera is the apartment slash like motel kill. I know exactly where, like, what you're talking about. A drunk couple, we follow them getting out of their car, and we're on the roof watching them, which is a really great shot. But then we switch to follow Ramses, yeah. who's not in the shot yet, but the camera zooms into this dark doorway, and then we wait a minute. <laughs> and then we wait a minute. <laughs> and then he shows up. And then the camera jitters again, like it's, it's expecting him to like continue moving, and he didn't. It's like, yeah. oh, okay, yeah. I love it. I love it so much. I uh, One of my favorite bits of this movie, uh, and I've tweeted about it a lot, is the book that Ramses has written, which <gasps> ultimately is his downfall, right? Oh, I forgot about the book. He has published a book of... Ancient, weird, religious rites, as opposed to ancient, normal <laughs> religious <laughs> rites. Like, that's a book that he has written and published, which eventually is the uh, is the connective tissue that brings the detectives to his door. And, and In a scene and that's blurry, him. by the way. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, there's a few blurry scenes. I honestly wonder, and it's things like that and, like, you know, Ramsey's makeup and stuff because it really looks caked on. I bet it didn't look like that in 1963, you know? Once you put this through, like, the 4K restoration filter, all of those little imperfections come out. It's kind of like we have movies that are on VHS that I don't think should be watched in any quality higher than VHS. Like The Blair Witch Project? That's one of them. <laughs> That not not for the same reasons, but that's just super scarier. Uh, like especially if you just like take the label off and throw it into the woods and let somebody <laughs> discover it. That would be fucking terrifying because you know it'll be a bunch of nine year olds being like, "I bet this is porn," and then oh, they like yeah. they go to thirty six different value villages trying to find a VCR player, and then they finally find one. It's the fucking Blair Witch Project. Oh man, we I... just made a, a new generation of horror fans. <laughs> I think we should start doing this like random acts of terror where we just <laughs> where we just throw vhs tapes into the woods we're just white out written on them like play me oh god <laughs> this so you, this sounds like a horror story but ultimately if we were taking the dog for a walk and i found a vhs tape that said play me best day ever <laughs> i would immediately call the police assuming that it's <laughs> potentially crime footage <laughs> that or a curse i'd I'd get somebody I don't like to watch it first. <laughs> I would I would be like, John, what did you do to get us into this saw trap we have clearly <laughs> just walked into? Did you happen to read how much this movie costs? I'm gonna assume nothing. <laughs> oh, okay, sure. So take a take a take a stab. Like how much do you actually think it costs? This in is like, not Herschel Gordon Lewis's first movie. In like nineteen sixty three dollars? Yeah. I don't even know what that okay. Carry the loaf of bread. <laughs> uh okay, so like I would say like fifty grand in today's dollars. I think it cost less than that in today's dollars. Oh, okay. Like it cost it cost in 1963 $24,500. That was the budget. Oh, that's more than $50,000 in today's dollars. That's probably like 100 grand in today's dollars. Shit, I did that wrong, didn't I? 
the inflation bit. I, I yeah, I don't know anything about inflation. You inflated wrong. I inf- I inflated the opposite direction. I deflated <laughs> the value. Yeah, so it cost it cost twenty four point five thousand dollars. It made. Want to guess? Most of that money probably went to the Playboy Playmate that they cast. Probably, yeah. Oh no, I saw how much. Didn't it make like four million? It made four million fucking dollars in 1963. Pretty crazy. It's amazing that they even made movies after this. Like they're (laughs) just like, we got our nest egg. I the other thing too that I love that I was reading about is that the the producer David Freeman, uh, who worked with Herschel Gordon Lewis a ton, like you know they they both basically came up with the story together. He. Seems like he was kind of like a local Chicago William Castle type producer. Okay. I think he's probably the one responsible for the idea for the trailer or even sort of stealing from 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 Hitchcock a little bit. Uh, but he had even they were giving out barf bags to people I in was the movie say theater. That, yeah, yeah, like when it premiered, it premiered at a drive-in, which is the best Rad. place to see this type Rad. of movie. I would jump at the opportunity to see this at a drive-in. Yeah. He also apparently took out an injunction on the film to bring up buzz that like people were protesting the movie like this movie shouldn't be shown but he's the one who took out the injunction wait sorry what's an injunction i had to look this up on wikipedia too don't okay. worry and uh, <laughs> the best that i got was that it was uh, a public appeal to stop a performance or an act from happening okay so like a, a karen form <laughs> Yes, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> I took out a public Karen injunction. Yeah, and uh, and he's the one that did it, just to get buzz. That's great. And it all worked. <laughs> so smart. Yeah, and uh, this was a video nasty. I, I saw that, too, that it like, was not fully released uncut until, like, 2005. Yeah. Britain, what are you doing? <laughs> I love that, though, because that just makes a generation of people really keen to see it. Yes. It doesn't matter what decade it is. Bad press always sells a horror movie. That is a good point. How do you f- how do you feel about the gore of this movie? Because it is super silly. Like you wouldn't necessarily call it camp, but it's very very goofy. I don't know if I agree with you. Oh, I think the only thing that is handled very seriously in this movie is the gore. Okay. In that everything else kind of falls by the wayside, but the gore scenes are shocking, and especially when you you consider them in like a 1963 standpoint, people weren't seeing stuff like this. That's true. And the fact that they used a lot of real sheep's tongue and like animal parts and stuff, they really wanted it to look like the real thing. Like when he pulls out that girl's tongue, they got a fucking tongue. It looks good too. And she like lulls her head and she's just, you can and see that like she's like shit coming out of her mouth. She's like trying Ugh. to like push out a bunch of blood. Ugh. It looks great because you can't see her tongue in there because her, her mouth is covered in red paint. <laughs> Yeah, the red is a little bit cherry red, but I like I fucking love it. I think it's great. It's super gory. Why do you say that it's camp? Oh, I said that it wasn't. I just I just see that it's silly. Like it's it's gory in the way that like an 80s horror movie is gory, but it doesn't have the same I don't know, it doesn't trigger that same sort of like lizard brain fear that I'm seeing something bad happening. And it's probably just because of the coloring and, mm-hmm. and like I'm watching it 50, 60 years later. Yeah, y- I feel like you're, you're really supposed to watch those scenes like they're, it's the first time you're seeing stuff like this and it's so fucking cringeworthy. There were a couple moments where I was taken out of it and, and I, in a good way because uh, this lends to your not camp but silly argument. Mm-hmm. They do a flashback with the Ishtar sacrifice and the victim is on like a slab and that's when they do the heart pull out scene but the actress they used is definitely like a beach bum and (laughs) she's got a total bikini tan line (laughs) in her toga (laughs) and they're pulling out her heart and you can just see the imprint of her bikini (laughs) oh you don't think anybody was tan in ancient Egypt (laughs) not bikinis (laughs) I think you, you you don't think at uh, 263 BC it was it was also hot girl summer. <laughs> oh my toga lines, <laughs> man! Imagine how good the ozone was back then. Is that what we're all gonna use time machines for to go back to get good even tans without any risk <laughs> so of skin cancer? So we don't have to cancer? wear sunblock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if the gore is all handled super seriously, the rest of the movie is definitely oh absolutely. Not. <laughs> <laughs> None of it's taken too seriously. Like, I don't think the movie takes itself seriously, even in the gore, but uh, I don't think it takes itself seriously enough to really be ridiculed for anything. Like, even in 1963, I don't think you could say, like, what are you doing? This isn't what a movie's supposed to look like, blah, 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 blah. 
But it's just like, that's never what the goal was. It was just supposed to make something silly and interesting that people couldn't look away from. And like, they, you can't argue that if this movie started playing, you would not leave the drive-in. Yeah, and I, I love to that the characters are so flimsy. <laughs> <laughs> this comes down to the fact that like it's it's unimportant, I guess. It's just not it's not what's driving the butts into seats. It's the gore and the violence and stuff. So yeah. uh one of my favorite moments is Suzette and her mom. They're they're sitting down just to like have a chat. And because there's no character here <laughs> Everything begins and ends with like, oh, those murders in town. Everybody in this movie is like, can you believe all those murders? Those murders in town. And then and Suzette's like, well, I should go to Egyptian class, but better get home early because all of those murders in town. Yeah, there's a lot of sentences started with, well, I guess, and <laughs> does, and then go on. Are with you the excited for your party? What with all those murders in town? Yeah, and a lot of a lot of mothers warning children not to go out late and then a lot of children saying my mother warned me not to stay out late i do very much enjoy though all of the instances of um the warnings on the radio and oh, when yeah. we like zoom in hard to a newspaper headline like yes. girl found legless or whatever <laughs> <laughs> man you are you are talking about one of the greatest cuts of this movie and you know i think it's a little rough because, you know, he's doing it himself and we're working with 1963 technology on a $24,000 budget. But yes, there are multiple instances of people grabbing newspapers and holding them for the camera to see them I like, love out it. in public. I love it. But the camera, you're right, zooms into one of them and then the newspaper gets crumpled by the police detective and now we're back in the police department. It's not as smooth as you would want it to be in, say, an Edgar Wright movie. But, like, you can totally see what Herschel Gordon Lewis is doing, and it's fucking genius. I do also want to give credit to that police station, and I use that with air quotes as well because it's just the corner of a room that they've set up a desk. It's got to be the production office, right? <laughs> it's her It's got to be Herschel Gordon Lewis's and office. And all of the scenes with the head detective are filmed there, but there's no miking or anything, so it's just... <laughs> echoey like they're in a huge ass room and they've just parked in the corner you know it's not too bad when it's just the two detectives talking but as soon as you bring in like a wailing mother who's grieving for her <laughs> daughter it does make it very hard to listen to an eight minute conversation <laughs> i think they're maybe trying to like hammer home that they don't condone violence in the early parts of this movie because everybody like there's the boyfriend who who doesn't get killed by Ramses but gets knocked out on the beach and then the mother of that girl who dies are both just unconsolable and really hamming it up it's really kind of a drag <laughs> it's, it's kind of a drag bringing it down <laughs> mrs friedman Something about the end of this movie I really like. I don't know why. Just him running away. So he's hosting this dinner party, and it doesn't look like he brought any he's food He's catering the dinner party. My mistake. He is catering the dinner party. It does not look like he brought any food, right? Yeah. He showed up. He's like, he I'm here. A, he did cook a leg. We saw him cook a leg. Y yeah. But it's not like he could just serve that to these housewives. It doesn't look like food. It, it looks, looks like, like a charred, charred leg. leg. <laughs> I was expecting it to look like a magic trick, to be honest. Can you imagine? Because there was a really great like time lapse shot yeah. where he put the leg in an oven and then one, like two, skip a few. Wipe came by. Yeah, and then there was like dry ice for smoke or whatever, and he opens the oven and it's just a charred ass leg. I was expecting it to look like a beautiful roast or something. Yeah, like are those things you put on ribs that look like <laughs> chef hats on yes. each toe, <laughs> just to hide the uh, the fact that it's a human fucking leg. That the toenails are like painted. <laughs> <laughs> he gets to the Fremont's house and all he's brought with him is a machete because he's going to cut up their daughter to serve to them. Which is kind of cool. It's a little metal. It's a little punk rock <laughs> of you, Mr. Ramses. Yeah. The but fact that he's trying to get her to like say the spell and whatever, she's so funny in those moments because she's like, oh, okay. I forgot it. <laughs> yeah. he, oh, you, you want me to just lie here on this counter all weird? Sure thing. Oh, mom comes in. At the 11th hour and saves the day, runs him out, and then- you... I'm surprised it's not the cop. Yeah, but the cop, the cops are on his tail as well, right? Like, they've figured it out. Man, I fucking love the end of this movie because we have watched this cop poorly piece together this investigation, which has led him to 
Ramses, who's now at his, like, new, maybe sort of imposed girlfriend's house to kill her. <laughs> Girlfriend slash fellow student. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, he definitely looks like Steve Buscemi, right? Like, hello, fellow kids. <laughs> I'm just here to learn about Egyptian culture. <laughs> But uh, when when they finally corner Ramses and he tries to he tries to hide in a garbage truck and gets squished. <laughs> R.I.P. Ramses. Which was a choice. <laughs> Super choice. Not a crime scene though. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the cops stand around ha- sharing cigarettes and just relaying the plot of the movie. Like, so how'd you figure this out, Pete? And then, Pete- well, let me <laughs> take you step by step through the film. <laughs> and then they just like, well. I guess that's another hard day's work, and they walk off into the sunset. <laughs> and they leave the truck with Ramsey's body in it. And like Even the-, the dumpster guy's like, oh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this, but I guess I'll just get back to work. He, like, closes the, the t- trap on it, and he's like, well, guess I'll drive off. <laughs> All in a day's work. Yeah, it's he runs away for a while too, like a long while. They, I guess they got permission to film at the garbage dump, and they just used every shot of the day. Ramses runs forever, so much so that the cop who had time to go and check in on his girlfriend Suzette, yeah, and console her, and then run off, had time to catch up. Everybody likes a good chase scene. Was it a good chase scene? Uh, not according to Variety or the L.A. Times. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's it's got its interest. It's got an interesting place in horror history. Obviously, it's crazy that a movie like this came out in 1963. Yeah, you know, like the this, balls on this film, right? <laughs> this, this is the same year that brought us from Russia with love and the haunting. And yeah, of course, you know, like even Psycho, which you know, arguably gorier in some regard than this movie shows nothing even the texas chainsaw massacre which came out 11 years after this not nearly as gory as blood feast right true yeah it's nuts and there was i think a couple nipples in this i think there were some nipples man blood feast has it all all (laughs) in 67 minutes oh no there definitely was because that girl was wait am i confusing the movie i'm pretty sure there was a nipple oh no wasn't there a nipple I can't remember. <laughs> I'm confusing the two because Ishtar and Sheetar are so similar. Oh, oh man, we I completely forgot about that. One last little thing is that like I like how the end of this movie plays with the idea that Ishtar is real. Cuz she cries blood. She does cry blood. We zoom in on that thing, but like so like we never see Ishtar uh come back to life or anything, but like the idea that she has manipulated this man into creating terror and murder and yada yada all in her name sort of says that she is real and and does exist and she still has followers and whatnot, which is like an interesting little button to end the movie on. Um, because what if he had have succeeded? Or, e- or even just the idea that like she is still around and can influence people. Like he wasn't just a crazy person who was using this as an excuse. He was actually maybe under her spell all Ooh. along. Is interesting and fun. One of my favorite moments that I almost forgot to talk about is the much necessary, so necessary pool scene where all the girls are hanging out by the pool. Oh, sure. And for some reason, Ramses comes just to be a shadow for a second, and then he runs off into the bushes. (laughs) Yeah, he just casts a little creepy hand shadow (laughs) over her face. Which looked fucking cool. Loved it. Made no sense. Looked cool. But- because obviously the girls are just like, so what's going on with your party on Sunday? I guess there was an issue with like sound effects or capturing sound for that. So instead oh, of like yeah. using pool sounds, they just, <laughs> I guess, went to the beach and captured the audio of waves rolling up on the shore. So there's there's very rhythmic splashing in those <laughs> scenes. It's a lot of fun. There's I, a lot of weird ADR it, in both yeah, of these movies. Favorite moment of the movie. So with all that in mind, Kim... What's your rating of Blood Feast? Yeah, you have to go first because I have no idea how to rate this. It's weird, right? Because it's not like, you, oh, this is a problem we come into all the time on the podcast. Like, it's not, we don't have a one grading system for every movie we watch. It's just like, oh, how do I rate this on against all of the other silly, weird, goofy, 60s horror movies we've watched? Which is not a lot, unfortunately. But uh, on the funometer. I'm giving Blood Feast a three out of four. See, I will. I don't know if I would rate it that high on the funometer. This is my second time watching it, and I will say I think I liked it more this time. Hmm. Maybe it's because I knew what I was in for, and I knew the pacing and and all of that junk. Yeah. But because uh, and I think too that there's not a lot of fun to be had in the murder scenes because I think they're really trying to be scary there. Yeah. So for us, it just seems long and needless. 
Is that what you're Not long and needless, but just like a little bit boring. Okay, sure. Oh, fuck. I'm going to give it a two and a half out of four. That's totally fine. Yeah. That's probably where I would have put it last year when I watched it for the first time. It's not like a celebrated classic of mine. It's still a fairly new watch. Uh, I also watched Wizard of Gore, one of his other like big movies. I really like that one. It's got a really weird ending. So I would, uh, I would suggest you try and seek that one out if you're looking for another schlocky 60s horror movie. Me seek it out? Yeah, you and everybody listening. <laughs> I'm like, me? 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 Okay, tell you what, tell you what. If you watch the original Herschel Gordon Lewis one, I will then show you the remake, which stars Crispin Glover. I mean, that is a sell. <laughs> How gory is it in relation to the gore in this one? Oh, it's the same. How campy is it in relation oh, to Oh, it's one? also the same. Oh. It is, it is pretty much the same deal. It has- What if I want more camp? More camp. So, like, those are the only two Herschel Gordon Lewis movies I've seen. <laughs> He's got like 67 movies in his catalog. That those are the only two that I've watched. Well, fuck, John, get on it. Well, I, I, another one that people always recommend is 2001 Maniacs. I don't know a goddamn thing about it. I hear it's great. Sort is there of like camp? A, it's a hick movie. I think maybe Color Me Blood Red or whatever is is the other camp style one. Blood Feast is tar- is part of like an unofficial blood trilogy. I want to have a blood trilogy one day. That'd be fun. The trilogy of blood. But you have to say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> blood. Blood. Like two U's instead of two O's. <laughs> I dig it. But that's just our opinion. Let us know what you thought of Blood Feast. This is part two of our Kooky Cannibal series. Uh, first episode was on Blood Diner, which we learned was an unofficial, not technically at all, a sequel to, to Blood Feast. And you can find that episode wherever you found this one. I'm sure it'll be one or two episodes right behind this, actually. Uh, but let us know what you thought of both of those movies. Or recommend a campy Herschel Gordon Lewis movie for Kim if you know more about him than I do. Uh, over on Twitter at NOFS Podcast or in the Nightmare on Film Street Discord at nofspodcast.com slash discord. If you're a fan of Nightmare on Film Street and you want to join the exclusive Fiend Club, head to nofspodcast.com slash Fiend Club for six bucks a month. You can unlock live streams, watch parties, game nights, Fiend Club membership card, and tattoos and stickers and tons of fun stuff. We do stuff every month over there, and it's always such a blast. That is at nofspodcast.com slash Fiend Club to sign up. But that's it from us on our Kooky Cannibal series. I'm John. I'm Kim. Stay Stay creepy. It appears you made it out alive, but we'll get you next time. Help us to grow the horde. Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you subscribe. More terror can be found lurking on our website, nofspodcast.com. Until next time, stay creepy, fiends.